Good afternoon or good morning, as the case may be. Good noon time. It's a pleasure to be here with you today, and thank you, Sandy, for that introduction. I'm always pleased to return to Rochester and see so many familiar faces and friends. Um, this is, the, I think, the 31st annual Outlook seminar, and I think it's the 31st one I've done. Uh, that's, I don't know whether that's a good or a bad. Uh, perseverance is one thing. Um, stubbornness is another, but I guess I keep coming back and doing it. Uh, you know, I lived, here, I lived here in Rochester for more than 25 years before moving south to Philadelphia. Um, and yet, when I return on these visits, I'm always reminded of Rochester's charm, its hospitality, the good friends, and of course, winners. I did wake up this morning to several inches of snow on my car, and uh, that was a little unexpected uh, surprise. Now, many of you may know that actually I grew up in Alabama. And it wasn't until I moved to Chicago to graduate school that I came to appreciate the extent to which the North could offer three things in great supply that I didn't know before. Coal, snow, and of course, hockey. I didn't even know what a hockey stick was until I went to graduate school. Now, this realization was driven home to me here in Rochester. As my children were growing up, I found there was a great way to combine all three of these events into one. It was called early morning hockey practice. Driving through the cold, the snow, and the wind to a 6 a.m. hockey practice at Lakeshore was always an exhilarating way to start the morning. Yet, as I learned more about the game of hockey, I found that hockey players could in fact teach us something, teach us some things that are relevant and useful for other disciplines, and believe it or not, including monetary policy. Hockey great Wayne Gretzky was once asked about his success on the ice. He responded by saying, quote, I skate to where the puck is going to be, not where it's been. He didn't chase the puck. Instead, Gretzky wanted his hockey stick to be where the puck was going to be next. He scored a lot of goals with that strategy. And I believe monetary policymakers can better achieve their goals too if they follow this Gretzky strategy. Good monetary policymakers, like good hockey players, must be forward-looking in their actions, setting policy that's appropriate for where the economy is today, or has recently been, is not likely to deliver on the kind of economic outcomes we desire. Anticipating where the economy is headed is important partly because monetary policy actions affect the economy with fairly long and sometimes variable lags. The major impact of policy often comes after several quarters or sometimes several years after the policy actions have taken place. Of course, the state and the evolution of the current economy as we see it today is relevant for shaping our outlook for the future. So policymakers are always revising their outlook as the data comes and as the economy evolves. That's why you frequently hear policymakers say that future policy decisions are data dependent. Now Gretzky, like all great hockey players, excelled in part because of his, his ability to anticipate. That does not mean he always anticipated accurately. Sometimes his forecast turned out to be wrong and the puck went in another direction and he was left in the corner of the ice by himself. But that doesn't mean that his strategy was wrong, only that his execution needed improvement. The more you understand the game of hockey or understand the economy, the better your forecast will be. Monetary policymakers similarly must be forward-looking despite its difficulties and uncertainties and challenges that that entails. So let me explain a little bit of where I see the economy and the outlook for both inflation and employment and some of the influences and uncertainties that are influencing that outlook. When I was here a year ago, I told you that the growth for the first half of 2009 was gonna be very weak, but we'd see improvements in the second half of the year. That statement, for better or worse, certainly reflects the pattern of growth we've seen this year, although I must admit that the very sharp decline in GDP in the first quarter of this year was much larger than I or most people expected. As a result, economic growth for the year will be somewhat lower than I projected a year ago, by a little bit. But nevertheless, growth declined only slightly in the second quarter, 
and actually in the first third quarter grew at a 2.8% annual rate. And probably it's continuing to grow at about that rate or maybe even a little better in the fourth quarter. I do believe that the economy is now in a recovery. And I have become more confident over time that it will be a sustainable recovery even as the fiscal and monetary stimulus programs begin to wind down. The long decline in housing activity appears to have bottomed out as home sales and housing starts have come off their lows that they reached earlier this year. Home prices also have appeared to stabilize during the last few months and even have begun to rise in some areas of the country. The commercial real estate market, however, has not turned the corner and it continues to pose some risks to small and medium-sized banks whose portfolios are heavily concentrated in this sector. Nevertheless, it's my view that these risks will lessen as the economy recovers. A number of indicators of manufacturing and industrial activity have become more positive in recent months. Industrial production has now increased for several months in a row. The Philadelphia Fed's Business Outlook Survey of manufacturing activity in our district returned to positive territory in August and has continued to be positive and grow modestly since then. Other manufacturing surveys have also been signaling that manufacturing output is beginning to expand. The strength of consumer spending, however, is more difficult to judge. In part, this is because auto sales were pulled forward into the summer months by the Cash for Clunkers program. Moreover, this, reba this rebate program likely diverted some spending towards automobiles and away from other things that consumers were planning to purchase. So it remains very much unclear exactly how much of the cash for clunkers program actually stimulated the total, the total spending, as some claim, or whether it just redistributed it around. Thus, the determining the underlying trend in consumer spending continues to be very difficult. Of course, the most important factor for consumer spending is the growth in personal income, which on balance has been quite flat this year. I'm not expecting very strong growth in consumer spending in the coming quarters, partly because of consumer in personal income and unemployment rates will remain high for a time. And those will all constrain income growth. Even so, recent monthly data have shown some increases in consumer spending, even outside automobiles and gasoline, which is encouraging. Looking ahead to next year, I expect GDP growth for the fourth quarter of this year to the fourth quarter of 2010 will be about 3%. I expect a similar GDP growth in 2011. Now these rates of growth, 3%, are more modest than what some forecasters anticipate, but they are slightly above what I consider to be the underlying trend growth of the economy of about two and three quarters percent. Now this time last year, the survey of professional forecasters predicted that unemployment rate in the fourth quarter of 2009, remember this was a year ago, would reach 7.7%. Well, as we now know, that turned out to be a bit optimistic. Okay? Current rate is now over 10%. And I anticipate that the unemployment rate may edge up slightly higher before beginning to gradually decline. Keep in mind, the changes in the unemployment rate and employment growth typically lag output growth. So even with better GDP numbers and better GDP growth over the next few quarters, unemployment rates and payroll employment will take a little more time before they show much improvement. So far, the most encouraging sign from the labor market is that job losses in recent months have been smaller than earlier in the year and continue to trend downward, which is a good sign. We'll get another reading on this this coming Friday. Nevertheless, I'm optimistic that payroll employment will start to rise in 2010, and the unemployment rate will begin to fall into the end of next year. Yet the recovery of jobs from this very severe recession will take time. It's likely to take a couple of years before we see the unemployment rates back to more acceptable levels. But that may not even be back to where we were in 2005 or 6. Now, one of the contributing factors to the outlook, to the better outlook, is, the is a steady improvement in the financial conditions. The recovery of financial markets from this crisis, however, is not complete. And more time will have to pass before we can be fully confident in the health of our financial sector. 
Indeed, I don't believe we will be able to determine how well the financial system is healed until the Federal Reserve and other government programs withdraw the extraordinary support that they provided to the, to the markets. By design, many of the facilities and liquidity facilities that we created were priced so that they would be less attractive as markets improved. So in fact, I've been encouraged as banks and other borrowers have relied less and less on the Fed's lending facilities and have relied more and more on financial market funding over the last six months. Those are all good signs. However, uncertainty still looms large. Large fiscal deficits and the prospects for significantly higher taxes to fund new government programs have made bus many businesses reluctant to undertake new investments or to rehire workers. This uncertainty may not diminish until greater clarity is offered by Congress and the administration about the prospective path of fiscal policy. This policy uncertainty could contribute to a weaker than otherwise recovery, and its resolution may affect longer term prospects for the economy. While the outlook for a strengthening, econ for a strengthening economy is gaining focus, the outlook for inflation is becoming more uncertain. At the beginning of this year, there were growing concerns that falling prices, not rising prices, were the most serious risk. Headline CPI inflation, after all, fell at a rate of 8% annual rate in the fourth quarter of 2008. And it fell at almost a 2.5% rate in the first quarter of 2009. On the surface, those are extraordinary numbers of an extraordinary amount of what we refer to as deflation. But in my view, they largely reflected the reversal of the dramatic rise in oil prices from late 2007 and in the first, two half, first half of 2008. Remember, oil prices went from less than $70 a barrel in mid-2007 to more than $130, $130 a barrel by mid-2008. Then they fell back down from their highs of about $130 or $140 a barrel down to almost $40 a barrel by January of 2009. Since that time, prices have risen somewhat, but have been fluctuating between $60 and $80 a barrel this spring, since the spring. Now the stabilization oil prices led, the sta when oil prices stabilized, that led to the end of the large deflationary shocks we saw in the first quarter. Actually, for the second and third quarters of this year, headline CPI inflation has averaged about 2.5% at an annual rate, a vast difference from that over 5% annual rate they declined in the fourth quarter of 2008 and the first quarter of 2009. What people call the core CPI, or the CPI excluding food and energy, exhibit a similar, but as you would expect, a much less dramatic pattern. Core CPI inflation averaged just 1% over the last quarter of 2008 and the first quarter of 2009. But the second and third quarters, core CPI inflation has been averaged about 2%. Year over year, it looks like it's settling in at about 1.5%. So my interpretation of this pattern is that market fears of deflation in the early part of 2009 were probably exaggerated being driven substantially by these wild swings in oil prices and commodity prices. Any risk of sustained deflationary pressures or of a sustained deflationary episode has now, in my view, greatly subsided. This interpretation is consistent with various consumer and market measures of expected inflation, which fell noticeably in the early part of the year, but now have risen back to levels we were looking at about two years ago. Now, contributing to these fears of fears, um, contributing to these fears of deflation or the lack of deflation now, is the fact that monetary policymakers in the spring and winter made it very clear that we would not permit deflation to take hold. So that's also contributed to the reversal in some of this. So we should all be pleased that the near-term prospects for either deflation or inflation seem mostly benign. Unfortunately, the prospects for inflation over the next two to five years is much more uncertain, and apparently uncertain in terms of the market as well. 
we have to remember that ultimately inflation is a monetary phenomenon. And there is no question that current monetary policy is extraordinarily accommodative. The Federal Open Market Committee has maintained the federal funds rate near zero for just about a year now, and the Fed has more than doubled its balance sheet in the process. Without appropriate steps to withdraw or restrict the massive amount of liquidity that we have made available to the economy, the inflation rate is likely to rise to levels that most of us would consider unacceptable. The great challenge facing the Fed is getting those, quote, appropriate steps right. The task is made more difficult in part by competing views of the economic forecast and the underlying structure on which those forecasts are based. Now, one commonly held view is that the economy is very weak, very weak now, and more important, that during the economic recovery that we see going forward, high rates of unemployment and very low rates of, of resource utilization will prevent inflationary pressures from rising for quite some time, perhaps years. This perspective suggests that there is no danger that excess liquidity will generate inflation in the foreseeable future. That indeed inflation is driven by resource utilization, not by monetary factors. This perspective suggests there is no danger that excess liquidity will generate inflation. Indeed, according to this view, the Fed need not worry about withdrawing liquidity or raising rates anytime soon because the inflation forecasts remain quite tame. But there's another view of the forecast and the way the model economy works. That alternate view shared by many others is that that just described, what I described to you as the conventional wisdom misses the mark. And it misses the mark because without a more deliberate policy of reducing liquidity and raising rates sooner rather than later, we could well see inflation become a concern. In this view, inflationary expectations play an important role in the dynamics of inflation. And it's the Fed's credibility to keep inflation low and stable that is the key to anchoring those expectations. Consequently, the Fed must act in a way that assures the markets and the public that it will take the necessary steps to keep inflation low and stable. If it fails to do so, expectations can become unanchored, and inflation then will rise regardless of the amount of unemployment in the economy. Now this view is consistent with both theoretical and empirical evidence that finds that economic slack or low resource utilization is not a very reliable guide to, or predictor for inflation. Moreover, there are a number of empirical studies that show that economic slack is difficult to measure with any accuracy. So making policy prescriptions and policy decisions on measures of difficult, me on such measures as slack, particularly when your forecast, when your policy decision depends on forecasts of that slack, many quarters ahead, becomes problematic. Indeed, the failure to act in a way that keeps expectations of inflation anchored can easily trump economic slack in determining the path of inflation. Recall that some of the highest rates of inflation this country has seen since World War II occurred in the late 1970s when high rates of unemployment and low rates of resource utilization existed. So what's the bottom line? While policymakers may have different outlooks for the economy and inflation over the next couple of years, our objectives remain the same. The Fed does not wish to see inflation rise to unacceptable levels, and certainly I plan to act with that objective clearly in mind. Now, Wayne Gretzky emphasized that anticipation was important to being a successful hockey player. Failing to anticipate in hockey means you always end up chasing the puck, never catching it. Since monetary policy works with a lag, policymakers must also anticipate and be forward-looking in their actions. Failing to do so would mean that policy would always be behind the curve playing catch-up, so to speak. The result would be greater instability in the economy and the failure to achieve our policy objectives. As I said, my, project, my projection for an economic recovery 
in growth is with growth of about 3% over the next two years. Stronger economic growth means stronger demands for credit, which in turn means upward pressure on real or inflation-adjusted interest rates. When economic growth is higher, the levels of real market interest rates should rise, at least assuming the central bank doesn't try to keep them from rising by pumping even more liquidity into the economy. Of course, higher growth today, combined with businesses and consumers that are forward-looking, produces higher levels of output in the future. So in my view, when output's higher in the future, we have higher levels of resource utilization in the future, is going to be signaled by today's growth rates, which imply higher real interest rates. That calls for the federal funds rate to increase as well as long as inflation is at or near its desired levels and expectations remain well anchored. Note that increases in interest rates may be appropriate then before, before unemployment and other measures of resource slack have diminished to acceptable levels. Failure to do so, failure to act in this manner risks continuing to inject liquidity into a rapidly growing economy at a rate that will increase inflation above desirable levels later in the cycle. If this were to happen, the Fed would lose its credibility to preserve low and stable inflation. So this forward-looking approach to policy is symmetric in that when economic growth weakens and the demand for credits decline, real interest rates will fall, and so should the federal funds rate. This would occur before slower growth is likely to show up in conventional measures of resource slack, such as unemployment. Thus, whether the economy is strengthening or weakening, this view says that policy measures should move before unemployment and other measures of resource slack provide a clear signal. Focusing on the short term, rather than thinking ahead to the intermediate or longer term, can lead to policy chasing the puck, so to speak, and thus always being out of sync with its own goals and objectives. Taking forward-looking policy actions is not an easy task. There are many real interest rates. They are not easily observed. They can be quite volatile. Thus, judging, when the, appropriate, or judging the appropriate response of policy at any point in time is fraught with challenges. We must assess what the current data and market interest rates are telling us about the future. But no one said hockey was e easy either. Wayne Gretzky was not the fastest nor the biggest of hockey players, but no one was as gifted as he was in looking ahead and anticipating where the puck would be, which is why he was known as the great Gretzky. True also for monetary policymakers. It's equally important when it comes to inflation. Since expectations play an important role in the dynamics of inflation, it's important that policy act in a manner that keeps those expectations well anchored near the Federal Reserve's inflation objectives. Policy must resist actions that drive inflation above or below the level deemed consistent with price stability or lead the, lead the public to believe that inflation will drift above or below. If expectations do become unanchored, then the Fed will have lost credibility, and either inflation or deflation could arise. Moreover, the cost of regaining the Fed's credibility may be very great. So anticipation and forward-looking policy is essential if the Fed is to achieve its goal of low and stable inflation. In the current circumstances, the Fed will need to withdraw the extraordinary amount of liquidity as provided to the financial markets to ensure that the public does not lose confidence in its commitment to keep inflation low and stable. Again, if it fails to do so, expectations could rise, workers could demand higher wages, firms demand higher prices to head off the expectation of higher costs, thus setting off a burst of inflation. Those risks, to me, bear careful monitoring. In conclusion, the economy is emerging from a severe recession and very low levels of economic activity and a low rate of inflation. Improvements in the job market will lag behind the rest of the economy as they typically do. 
Conditions in financial markets have been improving, and the need for the Fed's extraordinary provisions of liquidity will continue to dissipate in the coming months. Withdrawing that liquidity in a timely manner will be important in keeping the outlook for inflation and inflation expectations low and stable. But to conduct monetary policy, we need to be forward-looking. And looking ahead, I see an economy that will be growing over the next two years, which means that real interest rates will be rising. As they do, the federal funds rate should be permitted to rise with them. By doing so, the Fed can promote both stable inflationary expectations and achieve its goals of price stability and sustainable economic growth. If it fails to do so, we, will, we run the risk of missing our goals and creating unnecessary instability in the process. Thank you very much. Thank you, Charlie. That was very good. Uh, one housekeeping is after the, the conclusion of Jim Glassman's speech, we will have about uh, five to 10 minutes of questions, if you want to ask them uh, questions. There'll be a microphone around, uh, so please uh, think of some questions during this. Uh, next is Jim Glassman, and Jim is the Managing Director and Senior Economist at J.P. Morgan Chase, and works closely with our Chief Investment Officers, our Commercial Banking and Investment Banking and Government Relations Group. I know Jim a long time, uh, and I know that before he worked uh, for the J.P. Morgan family, he was at the Fed in many, of jo many jobs. Uh, he's awarded his Ph.D. from Northwestern University. If uh, you remember what I said before, that the last 18 months was a time when fear rules. Well, right now Jim is going to bring out, here comes the sun. Jim. Doesn't want to come out. <laughs> so anyway, while we wait for the computer to wake up, um, my message is going to be focused uh, more toward business community and the investor community. But uh, you'll notice, there we go. You should notice. Um, that an, an awful lot of what I have to say rhymes with what Charlie had to say about the policy process. You know, I, I, was, um, I was at a, uh, one of my favorite hotels in the last couple weeks, and um, in this hotel, when you go in your room, there's a little saying in front of each door, um, kind of like fortune cookies. I don't know if this is a West Coast thing or if this is what they do in this hotel chain. And the saying on my door read, people who live within their means have no imagination. <laughs> That's probably not good advice for consumers. <clears throat> but the truth is, there's, there's some wisdom behind that when it comes to the business community. And particularly when you're thinking about what are we facing today and, and what lies ahead. And I think the investor community has figured this out, figured this out um, in the dark days of around March 9th. Um, a corollary, maybe a better corollary of this would be people who are mesmerized by the past are gonna be missing opportunities in the future. Uh, bankers know, ba bankers have a mantra that goes along similar lines, good loans are made in bad times, bad loans are made in good times. And I think this is, th these are the times when you're supposed to pay attention and try to look forward and try to understand the rhythm of economic life and what could be going on here um, to, 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 and, and think ahead because I think, as Charlie pointed out, we are beginning to wake up and um, we think that we're probably on the way toward the real re a real recovery. Now, the, the picture here shows you GDP growth quarter to quarter in the U.S. We think the, the U.S. economy began to grow sometime this summer. It seemed apparent to us at the time that this was happening. Um, we had a decent quarter in the third quarter, 
we're probably getting a lot of help from fiscal stimulus, so we've got to be a little humble about what's going on yet. But I think the, the psychology is changing, and that's what's really key. Um, and as, as Charlie pointed out, this picture showing you GDP growth over four quarter periods. My own forecast is the black line. The, the shaded, orange shaded area is the Fed's own, the FOMC's forecast range. And I think they, 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 the, the Fed is the jury in this process, and I think their opinion uh, reflects an awful lot of how we all are thinking. Uh, we are coming out of a, a very bad recession. You would expect for a few years we're gonna see above trend growth for a while. That's what we are imagining as we think into next year. I personally am a little more optimistic than the FOMC range about next year. Um, as the picture shows, probably I'm a little more cautious about 2011 because I think we have not talked much about this yet, but I think we are, we are going to see a fairly substantial shift in Fed fiscal policy in 2011. The Bush tax cuts sunset the end of next year, and the Obama package fades out. And I think that's gonna prove to be a fairly challenging period. We hope this happens because we really honestly need to wean ourselves from fiscal stimulus. But this is a, this is a picture that pretty much echoes a lot of what we uh, who, who go through this process are thinking about. Um, I don't consider this to be overly optimistic because often when we fall into deep downturns, you expect to see a period of very rapid growth. And I hope, I hope we're wrong. And I hope what happens in the coming year or so is we're, we're gonna see faster growth than we, we all currently are expecting, um, even then is reflected in this picture. And you might think this is optimistic as an economist, thinking about these cycles and how they play out. Um, I, I see what we all are forecasting is pretty cautious. Uh, and and uh, it may look impressive, but the truth is, it takes a lot of this kind of growth to fix the problem. Uh, interestingly, look around the world, we look like a carbon copy of everybody. Uh, this is a synchronized downturn that happened. It intensified last, last winter. This impulsive collapse that happened, is a, lot, a lot of it related to the shock in the credit markets. And now we're seeing signs all around the world, wherever you look, there are very few countries that are not actually growing. So this is what we're picturing for the world, for the world economy, the developing world on the top line, Japan on the bottom line, Europe and the US in the middle, the blue zone, everybody else. So the, que the question is, um, uh, here we are with unemployment, 10.2%. Um, it takes a lot of growth. It takes a lot of above trend growth to get unemployment back down to where we think it belongs. And if you, if you take the FOMC's long run view as a, um, an assumption about where sustainable level of unemployment belongs, somewhere around 5%, there, there, there are divided views about this. That's what the, bar, the horizontal bar shows you. That's where we gotta get to before unemployment can be considered to be back to its sustainable level of output. It's gonna take time to get there. Those little bars are what the FOMC is forecasting. The line is what I'm forecasting. Because I'm expecting a little bit of a slower 2011 because of this fiscal challenge, um, I, I expect the progress on unemployment may be a little slower when we get there. Um, but, uh, you know, everybody knows, everybody can see the economy starting to come alive, but everybody's worried about the job market. The truth is, um, I don't really see, you know, we forget uh, watch pots boil very slowly. They take time to boil. And we forget how long it takes these things to become apparent from past cycles. I think one of the most impressive things that I've seen so far in the economy this year is the pace of layoffs, the line, the line. And it's, and it's uh, shown in a reverse scale and it's correlated with the GDP picture, which is the shaded area. That, that line is telling you, even in the job market, the lights are coming on. They, there's nothing real positive yet in terms of, we're not seeing hiring picking up. But the pace of layoffs, which is what Jobless Claims is telling you, the pace of layoffs is falling very significantly. It reminds us, many of us, of what we saw in that 1982, 83, 84 period. So for, for all those who are thinking it's gonna be jobless, you know, it always feels jobless when you're at the bottom of the, bottom of the recession. But the truth is, even in the job market, there's very promising uh, developments taking place as the layoff pace comes off. And we're hoping, we're thinking, by early next year, we'll start to see positive trends in employment. So the question is, does this all make sense? Of course, there is a very deeply negative view uh, about the economy. A lot of people are saying, don't believe it. It's, it's a false start. Um, th there are, most of us are becoming much more confident about recovery, and it's got to do with three broad things. One is uh, related to what we think triggered an awful lot of this impulsive collapse, the financial panic that really caused the problem last fall, the things that the, the things that Sandy cited are, are moving behind us, and I'll show you a couple of pictures to sort of 
put a face on this. Uh, number two, whenever we get into trouble, there's all kinds of things that happen. Uh, we make adjustments, and that's the most important correction. When, whenever, we, whenever we stumble, it's what we in the private sector do that fixes the problem. Washington helps, and it's certainly a big help what the Fed does and what fiscal policy does, but the truth is uh, the economy doesn't grow with the help of only Washington. It, it grows when we address problems and we get them behind us, and I think that's what's really uh, quite impressive about what has happened over the past year. The, the things that we have done to correct imbalances and correct problems is behind us, and this is why we and those in the, in the equity market have become much more confident about the prospect for recovery. And finally, on the policy side, of course, uh, zero interest rates, the actions the Fed has taken to buy assets while the financial system has been deleveraging and the banking system is trying to rebuild capital. Those are all very important parts in the, in the Obama fiscal stimulus package. So let me just talk a minute about the financial panic. If you remember, it was uh, a year ago. Uh, we were just, it was November 9, I think, was the most amazing day that I can ever remember. Um, in, in the wake of all that, crisis, all, all that turmoil in the financial markets, the central bank community announced a coordinated rate cut. The Bank of England, the European Central Bank, the Swiss Bank, the Bank of Canada, the U.S., Bank of Japan said, we're with you, but we can't go below zero. And um, the Chinese. The Chinese didn't, wasn't acknowledged in the statement, but the Chinese actually cut rates too. And the amazing thing was, as the central bank, this is one of the most important things central bank community can do, a coordinated rate cut. And what happened in the markets? LIBOR rates exploded. This is, this is a market that basically is the Fed's backyard. This is where I go to the Fed, I can borrow money, and then I lend it. Um, LIBOR rates, the top line, the Fed funds rate, or the expected rate for the Fed funds rate in the bottom, and that spike told you that this, there was, this was something new, something we had not seen before. It told you we had lost confidence in the ability of our economic leaders to manage the crisis. We shut down. And the problem wasn't just that we were losing confidence, we didn't understand what was going on. The problem was also that we could see that as Secretary Paulson went to Congress to ask for help to fund the financial rescue package, not a bailout, the fifth financial rescue package, um, the public had a real problem with this. And we understood in the blink of an eye that relying on the political system to come up with a solution was going to get very complicated and dicey and difficult. And it was that whole set of events that just turned the lights out in the credit market. And this is why if you were in a business that requires credit, the auto industry, the housing industry, exports and imports, uh, this is why everything went through this impulsive collapse in the winter. We've never really, we've never really seen, with the exception of a brief moment in the spring of 1980, Never really seen what happens when you disrupt the credit system, and we just learned um, in, in the winter. So, but, 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 but the positive thing is, here we are a year later, and when you look at the chart, what it tells you is the panic that froze the financial markets and the term funding market is gone. It's history. Uh, those spreads are back to what we always knew was the normal level, one-eighth over the Fed funds rate. I never thought I would see this, frankly. I never thought I would see it at least uh, for several years, and what it tells you is um, the fear that froze everything is past. Probably an awful lot has to do with the help the Fed gave and the excess reserves that were provided. But this is one, to me, this is one important thing that began to emerge earlier this year, which is one reason why we all um, we're started to breathe a sigh of relief. The other thing that's really quite impressive is that the credit markets have reopened. The, the, the risk appetites are coming back. I think the most in, uh, informative credit spread to look at is the high yield spread, which is on this picture. The difference between what an uninvested grade company pays versus treasury. These are, this, these are companies, this is our weakest link. These are the guys who, if the, if they're, if the economy's in trouble, they're in trouble. And markets shut down to them. Now what, what's happened since spring, that the spread really blew out very dramatically by, by early March. This has been coming down very dramatically, reminiscent of what happened in the spring of 2003. And what it's telling you is markets are reopening to even the riskier borrowers. And what that tells you is the probability of defaults is starting to come down. And my colleagues who, who make a living of trying to anticipate the probability of defaults, they've had to change their mind quite a bit. They were very negative early this year. They're becoming much more optimistic. So th this is a sign the credit markets are starting to reopen. Risk appetites are back. All an important first step in, in the recovery.
Now, the second thing that's been going on, there's a whole sequence of corrections, things that have been, things that have been happening to fix and address problems. I'll just focus on a couple of them because I think the pictures kind of tell you the story. Uh, but they have to do with, you know, banks, banks have recognized a huge amount of the problem. Um, the financial community globally has written down $1.7 trillion of assets on the expectation of you know, recognizing what they expect to be um, problems in the future. The oil markets have settled down. The inflated housing values that were causing so much trouble in the real estate in industry are behind us. Um, when we get into trouble, when demand falls, we things adjust, prices come down. That's how we, that's how we fix problems. That's how we reestablish some kind of normality. And uh, those 401k balances that we, if you bother to look in the winter, um, some of us didn't, but if you bother to look, those are coming back as the markets are coming back. And uh, the business community is making huge adjustments. So let me just show you a couple pictures of a couple things that, you, that, that, are, that are quite interesting and quite impressive. First of all, the housing, the housing market. You can no longer look at the U.S. housing market and claim that it's inflated. Now, you never had a problem here, frankly. But um, this picture is showing you the evolution of family income, the, the yellow shaded area. Uh, everything starts at 1 in 1970, and at any point in time, you're a ratio to 1970. So if you see a number like 8, it means you're 8 times as high as you were in 1970. The evolution of income, which is an important benchmark for how much of a loan we can get from our banker in normal times. House prices are the loan pricing corporation measure of national house prices. And what you can see, as you would expect, prices tend to track income, as they should, because the custom in this country is you don't get a loan from your banker if your monthly payment exceeds a 30-year income. That isn't what happened earlier in this decade. That was the subprime debacle. But what the picture shows you is prices, as we all know, got way out of line. They, they rose much faster than income early in this decade. In the last couple of years, they've been correcting fiercely. Prices are now back to normal levels relative to affordability. Um, that's why, as you look at the housing news, you shouldn't be shocked as the news starts to turn more, starts to look like it's more stable. Sales are beginning to pick up. Prices in many regions are beginning to turn up. The reason is because we've really kind of erased a lot of those inflated conditions, done a lot of damage, but the truth is, this, is, this nightmare is behind us. And in fact, the neighborhoods where the prices were most out of kilter are the ones that have corrected the most. Sacramento Valley, down to San Diego, Las Vegas, Phoenix, Florida. So uh, an important debacle, an important disruption that was in the way for the home building business is behind us. And this is one reason why, together with the actions of the building business, this is the contribution of the building business to GDP growth, quarter by quarter. And what it shows you is for the first time in three and a half years, uh, the building business is now clawing its way back. It's at a very low level of activity, below 600,000 units. The natural level probably is more like one and a half million units when they get the, these houses sort of worked off. But for the first time in three and a half years, this industry has got an excess problem behind them and they're slowly coming back, which is why uh, what has been a huge drag on gr GDP growth year after year for the past three and a half years is behind us. Um, Inventory situation. Businesses, when bad things happen, they have to make adjustments. They are right now in the middle of a massive inventory liquidation. When they've got inventories about where they want them, and they're very close. Most of our clients are telling us they're very happy. You can tell when you go to the store, um, things are quite lean. And what that tells you is when businesses get things about where they want them, for no reason, activity can start to pick up. And, that's, and, and when that happens, when inventory liquidations end, the level of production, the bottom line, is going to be moving up toward the level of demand. This is the inventory cycle that we all spend so much time thinking about. Uh, the actions that the business community have been taking, the cost cutting, the layoffs, the drive for efficiency, um, you see it all reflected in the profits that these companies are reporting. That's what this picture is showing you is GDP profits, after tax profits as a share of GDP. Um, it's quite stunning how dramatically the prof profits have been coming back. And of course, the, the gains right now are coming from cost cutting. Th that, that's an important first step. And as the revenues start to pick up, as the economy recovers, you're going to see a uh, very impressive recovery in profits. And I think what this tells you is businesses did what they had to do. When bad things happen, they can't wait, sit around and wait for the, and, and hope for the best like you and I can as consumers. Um, they, they have to get to work. And this is what they've been doing. And, and this is one of the reasons why the economy has gone through 
uh, such an, an impulsive kind of decline. Now, we, we don't need to belabor this, but in addition to the self-correcting things that we've done in the business community, the policy actions are quite impressive. The Fed has dropped short policy rates to zero. That's the lowest that they've ever been, but we also want to weigh that against where long-term interest rates are, which are sort of your best guide to where the natural level of interest rates is. And what it shows you is that this is, this is how the Fed changes, encourages a change in risk appetites. By driving interest rates down, they change the incentives for you and me to be moving funds out of cash into other kinds of things, and this is what's been playing out in the market. At the same time, unique to this time, the Fed has had to buy a lot of assets. And th this is showing you the asset side of the Fed's balance sheet. Create a lot of loan programs, buy assets, because the financial system has been deleveraging. Someone had to step in and hold the credit in order to prevent the economy from shutting down totally. Um, this has been an important part Ben Bernanke calls this the credit easing policy, an important complement to what the Fed has done on, uh, on interest rates. And finally, there's fiscal policy, and um, we, we'd like to get off this as fast as we can, but it's important to remember for all of us who are worrying about the high level of government borrowing, it isn't the first time we've thought about using fiscal policy. It seems that since President Kennedy's time, this is what we do whenever the economy goes into recession. We hope it's temporary. It is by design only supposed to be a couple year program and then fades out and this will be the issue for 2011. A uh, quick comment about the consumer. I hear people, everyone says the consumer, how are we ever gonna get going unless we get that consumer confidence back? Consumers are 70% of our economy. Frankly, I never worry about the consumer. I never think about the consumer. And we economists, when we study the business cycle, we spend a great deal of time, when we are focusing on the business community, business capital spending, inventory behavior. It's the business sector that is the dynamic element in a business cycle. Consumers, you pay us and we'll spend. Stop laying us off and we'll, lay, we'll spend even more. And, and, and the difference is that consumers, unlike businesses, don't live in a mark-to-market -market world. I don't have to look at my 401k statements. If I'm a business, bad things are happening, I have to focus on the problem. I've got shareholders. Consumers don't have shareholders. And an awful lot of the activity the business community does is investment in projects that are going to produce, be producing a stream of benefits down the future. If I'm nervous about the future, I, the business community, then I can shelve projects. And that's, it's that action by the business community that really whips these economies around. It's not the consumer. The consumer, really much of what the consumer does is on automatic pilot. And that's why the volatility in our economy is all about the business sector. So I don't worry about the consumer. Um, we've seen the economy come back many times when unemployment's high, and there's a good reason for that. Get, get, get the confidence in the recovery back, get businesses moving again, get the excesses behind us, and, and good things happen. Now, uh, quick, quick comment on the Fed's, on, on what's ahead for the Fed. Charlie's much more concerned about the inflation outlook. Um, thankfully, that's what the central bank is supposed to do. Um, the Fed has a couple things they're looking at, and both of them tell you, um, you're probably gonna be, it's, it, we're, we're, you need a little patience, because for the first time in a long time, this is the core measures of inflation, CPI and the PCE chain measure. They're running a little below the FOMC's long run forecast. The interesting thing about inflation, if we believed our models, we economists would be forecasting zero inflation for the coming years. We're not, because we're not quite sure what's going on. And as Charlie pointed out, there's a great deal of uncertainty about inflation. With all this unemployment, you would expect to see more disinflation. Uh, that is probably where the risks, the, the, more likely that the, the inflation is gonna settle lower than go higher. But this is an important guide to be thinking when you're thinking about where's the Fed going. This tells you there's no real rush. The inflation trends are fairly benign. And um, we think, with, a, with a, the U.S. and a global economy very underutilized, we probably are gonna see, it's a very competitive environment for pricing. A second issue is the unemployment rate. As we showed before, it takes a long time, a lot of growth to dig out of this hole. Both of these arguments tell you um, we've, we, we're, we're moving in the right direction. It's gonna take some time. Um, we probably would do more harm by pulling back quickly. That, that's the danger. Right now, we've got things moving in the right direction and we hope that, gets, that, that keeps going. Uh, let me just be, make a quick comment about the Fed's balance sheet because it, gets, it generates a lot of concern. And let me give you my, my interpretation, which is a little more benign than you might hear from Art Laffer, for example, if you remember an op-ed he wrote in the Wall Street Journal. The Fed, because the, the, the ideal thing to do 
when we had this crisis would have been to set up an operation like the RTC, fund it with Treasury, not have the Fed involved. The problem is you need Congress to pass legislation to fund such a thing. They weren't in any mood to do it. The Fed but discovered, they knew, they had the ability to do this. And in order to cushion a financial system that's deleveraging, and banks that are very focused on trying to rebuild capital, the Fed has had to come in and buy assets. If they didn't do that, they're buying almost up to $2 trillion. If they didn't do that, the financial system probably would not be, we would not see the kind of recovery we're seeing in the financial system. Um, and so if you look at the Fed's balance sheet, the asset side of the balance sheet, this is what they've been doing. They've been buying assets, they've been creating programs. Now, we all worry about this because when the Fed, how does the Fed pay for this? They create reserves out of thin air. And this is, the, this is what's got people nervous. When the Fed creates reserves, it has the potential to get into the system, to get loaned out, and become part of the money supply, and that's why you worry about inflation. But as you can see from this picture, which is showing you the liability side of the Fed's balance sheet, all those reserves the Fed created, look at the red zone. All those reserves the Fed created are all excess reserves. Excess reserves have increased by a trillion dollars. What that tells you is the money the Fed created to pay for the assets is not really being put to work. It's sitting idle on the Fed's balance sheet. We're very limited. It's, it may be helping in the term funding market. And this is the reason why, if you go back to your money banking textbooks, you worry about these things because when the Fed prints money, when the Fed creates reserves, the way it gets into the economy and becomes inflationary is it has to get loaned through the banking system. But that's, and that's the reason why all those reserves the Fed has created has expanded the monetary base, which is the foundation of the money supply, um, the, the fuel that creates the money supply, the monetary base has exploded, the money supply is not. And the reason for that is because we in the banking community are trying to rebuild capital, loan demand is low, and the financial system is deleveraging. We've lost a few big institutions that don't have the capacity, the system does not have the capacity to provide the credit. So, um, you know, if this changed, and if it looked like we were beginning to lend this activity out, I have no doubt, I have, we have total confidence that the Fed will understand what's going on and the Fed will respond. This is why, for many of us, we're not concerned about what the Fed has done. Um, with, 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 and we think it's an important part of helping to stabilize the financial system. Now, final comment. People say, aren't markets getting ahead of things? And we look at the stock market, we're up a fair amount from March. Um, my feeling is, um, if you want to wait around for the proof, uh, you might miss the boat. That's Noah on the ark. <laughs> this is Noah on the ark. And, and I think this is, the way you're, this is the way we investors think about the situation. We can see what's going on in the private economy. We can see the fixing that's going on. We can see the Fed lowering interest rates, but we don't buy stocks just because the Fed's got rates at zero. Frankly, I'd much rather, I'd be much more comfortable owning stocks if the economy were robust and the Fed had rates at normal levels. I've got to use my imagination um, in order to buy stocks when, uh, when I'm doing it and the Fed's got the rates at zero. Well, the, the, reason, the reason we're willing to do this is because we know the economy cycles. We in the markets know the economy cycles. We've been through this 48 times since George Washington was inaugurated on Wall Street. And what we can tell, we in the markets and the business community can see that the tide has gone out and it's beginning to come back in and there's an awful lot of help and an awful lot of reason to have confidence in this. And, and that's, what, that's what we're banking on. We're, we're, our sense is that, the, that things are coming back in again. And if that's true, you want to think hard about where we're going, not about where we've been. And that's why I think the markets are doing what they're doing. And I don't think it frankly takes a lot of imagination uh, given all that we've seen play out this year, and it's, it's a stunning year, but I think um, the events as they've been playing out are giving all of us much more confidence that we're finally on the way to a real recovery. So why don't I stop there, and we'll take some questions.